What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD mode interview. Every single week, we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses out there dominating their spaces. The people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves and for their family. So real quick, before we jump into today's podcast with our amazing, epic guest, make sure that uh, if you're not watching this on gsdmode.com, make sure to check us out there, right? So lots of amazing content on there, lots of amazing interviews on there, um, as well as I got a lot of free stuff that I offer. We just started offering, or I just started offering 41 free coaching tips uh, uh, with uh, me personally, um, as well as a lot of free webinars. So go to gsdmode.com, check us out. Truly appreciate you guys' support. All right, so today Today's guest, you guys, this is a good personal friend of mine, um, just an absolute badass, right? So this is a, a top real estate agent, top real estate team leader. Um, this is a dude that jumped in the business. So the podcast is going to start where he's talking about his journey in 2007 when he jumped in the business at a time where everybody else was exiting the business here, at least in, in Phoenix, Arizona. He jumps in, becomes really like the short sale king of the area. He just dominates with short sales, has a lot of success with short sales. And he talks about um, how he got into short sales, how he created success with short sales, um, as well as though how how he made the transition out of short sales and the struggles that he went through um, from transitioning out of short sales into being a traditional real estate agent um, to now uh, where he and his actual business partner um, uh, have expansion team. So not only do they have a, a very successful residential real estate team here in the Phoenix metro area, um, they're out now in six different states. So they've taken their model and expanded uh, very successfully into all these other states. And you hear a lot about expansion teams inside the real estate business, right? Um, I, it's something that we all hear a lot about, at least I hear a shit ton about it. Uh, but very few people that I've met have actually got it right. Um, and uh, these guys are doing it and they're doing it right. Uh, but in the interview, um, our guest is going to talk about like what they didn't do right, you know, and how eventually they figured out what they're doing right today to go out there and create success. Um, so really stoked and honored to have uh, an amazing real estate agent, amazing team leader, and one of my really good personal friends, Kevin Kaufman, on the show. Um, so we're going to pick up right 2007, right when he gets in, and we're going to go through his journey. See you inside the podcast. And so over the course of a couple of weeks, we got together, had coffee. And um, what I found out, he's, he was really an, uh, a businessman who just gave back to the community by teaching a couple classes a semester. And I just literally took every class he taught for the next four semesters in a row. Uh, if he taught it, didn't matter what it was, I was going to take it. Now, luckily, it was almost all around real estate or business. And um, so I took those classes. And sort of along that journey, I just decided, like, you know, I know I want to be in and around real estate, so I'm just going to get a real estate license. Like, I didn't know anything about being a, a quote-unquote realtor. Like, I thought realtors were, um, I think, what the general public thinks realtors are. And I didn't know you could actually have a business. I, I didn't really know any of that. I just knew that I wanted to be around it. And I knew I had to work. If I was going to start a business, I was going to need money to do that. And so, got a real estate license in the middle of 07. Um, I'll never forget, like, eventually I had this point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep working for this giant corporation. Um, and my soul was dying a little bit every day. And so, uh, and I was, in, I, was, I was engaged, man. I was six months out from getting married. It's 2007, right? So you remember that. Like, I literally had friends trying to stop me from getting a real estate license. They're like, dude, you're too late. Like, you missed the cycle. And I'm like, who cares, man? Like, pretty much if you tell me not to do something, I'm going to go the other way. Like, I just, I just... I'm, that's how, just how I roll. And so I went for it and, uh, and I looked up and my third deal was a short sale and then just kind of went, okay, cool. I can make this work and started, started going to town and it wasn't, but a couple months later, Fred and I started working together who we'd already been friends for a number of years. Um, so yeah, it was like, literally it's this conversation I had at a class at South Mountain Community College in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, by Professor Goodner that really altered the course of my life. Yeah, that's epic. Yeah, no, I love it, dude. When you talk about getting in 2007, you know, you're, you're like the firefighter running in when everybody else is running out. And I, dude, I remember my first short sale and I had no idea it was a short sale. My sellers didn't know it was a short sale either. You know, I get a call from the title company and they're like, yeah, uh, is your seller going to come in with the, with the cash to, you know, pay the, pay the what's left over in the mortgage? I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, they had taken out a line of credit 
in oh, addition man. to their mortgage and had no idea. They didn't know the line of credit was attached to the house. They didn't disclose that to me. So it kind of turned into a short sale, man. So talk to us about your first short sale, dude. Like, um, you know, cause a lot of people are freaked out about navigating those and we know what's to come, you know, right. Second, oh, second yeah. longest bull market and recorded history. Like this is going to repeat itself. It's, it's, you know, who knows yeah. when I'm a crystal ball, 12, to 18 months, who knows what it's going to look like, but it's going to come again. But those that might have fear of like, oh shit, you know, right? Like, what am I going to do when the market crashes? Cause you were a dude that jumped in when the market crashes. And not only did you jump in, like, dude, you, you know, we're in the same market, those that are watching and listening. So Kevin was like the short sale king, you know, right. Um, in our area. Um, and you had massive, massive success with them. So kind of, kind of talk to us about what that first one was like. And then from there, how, how did you connect the dots? Like, holy shit, like this is something and, and expand that to such a successful short sale business. Yeah, man. So I'll, I'll tell you what. So it was like my, my third, I'd sold like one or two houses to some friends. And then um, Fred, my now business partner comes to me and he's like, Hey, I, I got these listings. Um, I got a couple of listings and they're, they're these things called a short sale. I didn't really know what a short sale was, but he told me, and he, he quite literally said to me, Josh, he's like, I don't even know if the bank will pay us. Like, I don't know how this works because I've only done this as an investor before where I paid off the note and, um, and then actually took title to the property. So I said, okay. Um, you know, and he said, I need help. I'm going to be out of the country on my honeymoon. Do you want to help? I'm like, yeah, why not? So like, you know, here I am. I've done two deals. It's summer of 2007. There's what, 60,000 homes on the market in the greater Phoenix area. And I'm just like, yeah, why not? What the hell? Let's go for it. So I took the short sale. And the, I think the thing I had going for me, number one, is I had this belief and mindset that you can make whatever happen as long as you're willing to fail enough and keep trying and just go for it and keep looking for new solutions. And so um, I remember I also had this training, if you will, by um, what's his name? Carlton Sheets. So Carlton Sheets, late night infomercial, no money down guy, right? Yeah, that guy had taught me about real estate because I listened to him all the time. And so I had a little bit of an idea of the mindset of what goes on here. And so I went out and I just decided I, was, I got an offer on the listing literally like right before Fred got married. And I'm like, never negotiated a listing before. So I got it under contract, sent it to the bank. And I just decided I was going to bull my way through it. I was just going to, I was just going to knock everyone over who was in my way. And I, it was funny, looking back on it, it was one of the easiest short sales I ever did. Um, I probably got it approved in five or six weeks, and it was like an $800,000 deal. Um, and But I kept asking questions. I made friends with the negotiator, and I learned everything I could from this guy. Um, and, you know, I just took that, and I went, okay, cool, I can do these. And then I realized everyone else was afraid to do them. And I was like, I'm not, I'll keep doing them. And then, I mean, it wasn't, but a couple months later, Fred and I had both found ourselves. We weren't, we weren't partners then at that point, we weren't business partners, but we were both doing some short sales and we'd help each other from time to time. And uh, a lot of short sales found their ways to, to, to both of us. And uh, we found ourselves in a situation one day at lunch where like, maybe we should be sitting together in the same office and helping each other negotiate. Cause it's kind of a pain in the ass when you're calling these, people at a bank who quite honestly just don't give a shit at all about anything other than when their next break is right. Like their life sucks and it's a bad environment and you get hung up on a lot and things like that. And so we said, let's go share an office and uh, let's see what happens. And then we, we kind of put together a plan. Like I think we might've had 10 or 11 listings between the two of us at the time, but we just said, Hey, let's go help each other out. So this is like now January of 2008, we're having this conversation so I've been in real estate six months at this time. And the following month, February 2008, we, uh, we partnered together, partnered, if you will, meaning we split the cost of an office. Uh, we split the cost of a second office and we put his brother in that office who had kind of been helping both of us out with some administrative duties and listing assistant type of duties. Uh, while Fred and I just negotiated the short sales and talked to sellers. And, uh, Man, what we realized quickly is that nobody knew what the hell they were talking about with short sales. And I, I, it wasn't a couple of weeks later, I go to this class at this, uh, at this office and there's this guy doing CE classes for, um, for uh, the state of Arizona and the subject is short sales, right? So picture this, it's January 2000 or February 2008 in Phoenix. And I walk into this room and uh, like, 
it's a, the class is about short sales. So there is like 60, 70 people in a room that comfortably fits 35 or 40. Like it was packed. And the very first thing this dude says is, and this is an exact quote, I'll never forget this moment. Don't do short sales, they're bad for your business. That's a quote from this guy who the state of Arizona has been <laughs> okay to give CEs to their real estate professionals. I was like, what the fuck is this? And so I was that guy for the next three hours. Like I just kept raising my hand. And every time he would say something that didn't line up with my experience, because at this point I'd closed a couple and I was negotiating, you know, another 10 or 12. Um, and so that made me the expert, right? I closed like three or four, which is three or four more than anybody else. And so I just literally just kept raising my hand and I would be like, well, that's not really how it works. This is how, the, this is how that works. And I must, I had to have pissed him off and everybody else in the class because I, I probably interrupted him 20 times in three hours. And, but I just wasn't going to let him teach that. And I remember I went back and I talked to Fred and I talked to this other guy, Mark, who was really influential in our life and especially the beginning part of our business. Um, and I was like, I told him about this class. I was like, guys, that's just total bullshit. Like, I can't believe they're teaching this. And so we just decided, like, that's dumb. Let's go teach a class of our own. And it wasn't but a couple of weeks later. It was like March 8th, March something of 2008. We decided to start teaching short sale classes. And it was just re- as we decided we were going to be re- as ridiculous as we thought everybody else was ridiculous. So everyone who shows up in a suit and tie and feels like you have to do that for success. And everyone that says you can, don't do short sales, they're bad for your business. Because at this time, everyone's telling me all the reasons why I shouldn't be successful in real estate, right? And how I shouldn't be in real estate and how I don't dress nice enough to be in real estate and blah, blah, blah. And so we just decided to go completely the other opposite angle. And we call, we call this class March Madness, Dick Vitale's Guide to Short Sales. That's what we called the class. And we just invited everyone who showed our listings. And like three people show up. Uh, and one of them was on payroll. So, you know, that didn't really count. <laughs> but um, but, the, but we were like, we got good feedback. And then, so we're like, well, let's teach again in a couple of weeks. So we invite more people. And those people who did come all brought two or three more people. And what happened is we just start building this thing where we're teaching, we found ourselves just teaching this class, the same class every other week for first it's two people, then four people. And then it's like, all of a sudden it's like 50 to a hundred people literally twice a month. And then we start doing them in different offices around the, around the, around the Valley and boom, like everything just blows up. Like we're getting referred like crazy. It's opening doors and making relationships to that. I still utilize to this day. Um, and you know, it was like the, one of the best things we ever did, but it really helped launch our business. And it was, a, it gave us that unfair advantage that we needed to really get going. So I swear, man, looking back at it, February 1st, 2008, Fred and I combined had 10 or 12 listings to our names and it wasn't, but four or five, maybe six months later, we probably had 90 or a hundred, like it just blew up and we, it was hard. We had to make it work and we somehow made it work. And that's kind of how that's, that was the start of our business. And we just decided to plant our flag in short sales because number one, nobody else wanted to do it at the time. Um, number two, it, the people who did want to do it didn't know what the hell they were doing anyways. And so they were just screwing it up for the rest of us. And we we're just like, we're just going to go and take control of this. And we're like, you know, we just decided that, we're, that was going to be our thing. Uh, we wanted to be the bank's boss, not be, subject to the bank. So we weren't going to go take REOs because we'd both had that experience being a corporate employees and we didn't want that feeling again. So we decided we'd go build a database and we'd do that around helping people out of distressed situations. Yeah. Love it, dude. So, you know, what's so cool about this is it's the opposite approach most real estate agents take, you know, right? You guys are like, hey, we're going to come from a place of abundance. We see the, the training being delivered suck, sucking. We're going to go out there and give the right information. You know, I'm guessing you probably didn't know that was going to lead to, to re- all these referrals at that time, you know, right? But it just seems like abundance always plays off. And so many people have this, I'll do if I teach Kevin my secrets, you know, then I can't succeed. And it just, you know, and, and again, those that are watching, listen, don't know our relationship, but we're in the same market. We're, you know, competing, you know, team, <laughs> if you will, but dude, like we're open books. Like here's everything I do. Here's everything you do. We can all, we can all succeed together. And um, like when you guys started that, was the referrals the plan or was it just like, dude, this guy did such a shitty job teaching us. We're just going to go give back and, and teach us and see where it goes. 
Honestly, yeah, dude, I was pissed. I just was pissed that that was the education they put out. And the, the other thing was I had a couple of cross sale agents, like when I told them I got the deal approved, they were like, what, you got it approved? We've written on 10 short sales. No one's ever gotten it approved before. My buyer's gonna be, they're not even gonna believe this. How did you do it? And we're like, well, we should just go teach people. And, and the reality was is like, we th when we taught the class after the first two times, we realized, oh, this might, like we weren't even that smart, dude. We are just like, <laughs> let's just go teach it and see what happens. Like that's the one thing we know is if you give, you like you can't tax people into prosperity, but you can you can be a, you can be abundant and you can give yourself into prosperity. And we, I just totally believe that. Fred believes that has a lot to do with our visions just being aligned. Um, and we just started giving, and then we realized, whoa, there's a lot to get back here. And it was we weren't real sure. You know, it's like you know John Chet Black who we were with last week. Like he always talks about invoking the law of reciprocity, right? I didn't know that's what it was at the, at the moment. But that's all it was, dude. And I like I'm telling you, I've got solid relationships today, and doing that put me in rooms that, quite honestly, from like a business standpoint, I didn't deserve to be in at the time. At the time. Yeah. And it put me into relationships with people I didn't necessarily, I hadn't earned from a business standpoint. And so we just kept doing it. Now, we could have done things better and smarter and a lot like you. I should have been selling the information, but I'm not afraid to put it in other people's hands because I know that I'm going to execute. And I also know that some, some others will and some others won't. It's up to them. And so I'm not worried about it. Like, I'll share all my information. I'm an open book. We've always been open book. Happy to share every single thing I have. Um, because the reality is, is sure we're quote unquote competitors, but I know you and I both don't see it that way. Like I'm not competing against you. No, I'm competing against myself. Like that's just the way it goes. And, um, I feel bad for people that think that they're competing against other people. Yeah. what's cool about it. And we'll talk about this later. Those that are watching, listening, but you know, Kevin still operates and Fred, his partner, that's not here today, but still operates in the same capacity. We'll talk about, they, they've got this free Facebook group for real estate agents, which is, uh, uh, the best real estate group. I mean, it, it makes mine look silly. I'm like, shit, I got to up my game because these guys give so much. And we'll talk about that later, but you know, you still follow that today. So then, all right. So then short sales end, you're transitioning out of short sales. And I, I got pigeonholed in, into this myself. And I don't know if you did or not, but I got known as the REO and short sale guy. So a lot of people, e even like friends and you know, whatever um, that I knew really well, when the market started turning, I was known as the REO and short sale guy, not as the traditional guy. And they didn't yeah. even know that I did that because I did so much REO and short sale because in this our market, that's really all, all that was existing. We got known for that. So with that transition, you know, did you have a difficult time transitioning out of short sales back into traditional or, or were you smarter than I was with kind of reading the writing on the wall and, and branding yourself appropriately? No, man. I, I mean, Honestly, in the moment, I felt like I was getting my ass kicked, if I'm being totally straight with you. Um, I feel like we didn't do that as well as we could. Like, looking at it now, knowing what I know now, obviously, I have way more business experience today. Um, could have handled it better. A lot of people tell me, like, dude, you handled that really well for somebody that was so heavy into one niche. Um, but it wasn't definitely not good enough. Like, I, like I, I think we did okay. But, yeah, it was hard, man, because I was the short sale guy, right? Everybody knows. I still take – we still take short sales. We still close 50 or 60 a year today when we've been appreciating like crazy. Right. And we're, so we're still, still known in some aspects as those short sale guys. Um, but no, it was hard, man. It was really hard. We had to make sure we got very clear about, well, hold on a second. We sell, we sell residential real estate. Right. And uh, like, I always say that 2013, so the end of 2012 is when we realized we had a problem. And that problem was that, I hadn't taken listings, right? I hadn't taken that many traditional listings that weren't really close referrals from my sphere or stuff that I didn't really have to compete for. And uh, the market was changing. So here we are in Phoenix, right? We go from 75, 80% distressed sales down to like 20 or 25 by the beginning of 13. I was like, oh shit, um, there's an issue here. And I'll, to be straight with you, we had a whole other issue in our business uh, that had to just do with leadership and and Fred and I just we made mistakes right everybody makes mistakes and and we were in a place where we had to we found ourselves as the only salespeople in the company at that time and so I was like well dude I'll, I'll go take listings and because I wasn't going to drive people around and Fred was like well cool I guess that means I guess I'll, I'll be the lead buyer's agent so but it was hard dude it was hard I got my ass kicked 
I went on listing appointment after listing appointment and uh, I continued to just get my butt kicked and it was hard. I was probably, I was used to taking basically any listing I wanted because I had the information that almost nobody else had and I had the skill set and I had the success rate that nobody else in the industry could claim. Uh, and then all of a sudden now it's all about what were my consultation skills like at the kitchen table? And that was hard. Like I couldn't rely on the fact that, well, dude, I just sold 750 houses. Like, okay, like that's no longer that was good enough for the resume. So I always say 2013 was the year I had to become a realtor. I had to learn how to be a realtor. Like I had to learn how to sell, so to speak. I, I still don't even love that word, but it's what it is. I had to learn how to sell, right? I had to learn how to be a realtor and I'd learn how to present my value proposition and find a way to solve problems for people in a way such that, that they wanted to hire us to sell their house. And, uh, you know, it's not that we did things different once we got the listing. It was all about what we did prior to the appointment and then at the appointment that earned us the business. And so here we go from 2012 we go backwards for the first time ever. You know, I'm out of the business. I don't do anything for the first part of 2012 in the business. The end of 2012, I kind of come back into it. I don't even want to talk about the mistake I made in 2012 uh, with a uh, with a job. Um, but I, I roll back into the business. And I don't have any, I don't have a job in my own business, and I don't know what to do. And so I quite literally just start calling old leads. I just started calling leads because I didn't know what else to do. And I started setting appointments and I pulled out some, you know, pulled out quite a few deals. But here we are now, 2013, and I'm like, I know how to do that. But now I'm the only salesperson here, uh, at least on the listing side. And then all of a sudden, they're not all short sales, right? So I had to learn how to do that. So I'm calling my friends. Like, I'm calling Matt Fedick in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area. I'm calling my buddy Jesse Moore in Seattle and Ben Kenny in Seattle. And I'm calling all these people who I know how to take listings. And I'm going, what do I do? Like, how do you get someone to say yes and sign paperwork? Because I'm tired of people saying no or saying, well, we got to think about it because we got one other person to interview and then we'll call you back in two days. Which, by the way, that's a fucking no. That's a no. Like if you leave the listing appointment and don't have a signature, it's a no. And so like I had to train myself that way because I'm like the guy, like I don't want to sell you anything. I want to, I want to consult you with what you need. Like, and then if what I have matches that need, great. Here's how we do business. And if it doesn't, I'm okay with it. I had to get over that part and understand how to tap into people's real motivation to actually help them understand what might, what might help them move forward in their life and with their goals. And so that was a, it was a hard year for me, man. I got kicked in the teeth. We went backwards for the one and only time in our business. We went from 2012, we sold just over about 220 houses. Uh, uh, again, me not doing it, basically any of it, Fred not doing any of it to 2013, Fred and I doing all of it. We sold like 130 houses that year. Yeah. And it, it sucked, man. It sucked. Like the money was okay. Cause our expenses were super low. We had no cost to sale um, because we were the ones doing the sales, but being in the trench, like it just wasn't what I wanted. Like I, like who wants to take 80 listings a year and run a business and try to figure out direction and strategy. Like I'm definitely one of those singular, I do better when I can focus on one job. And, and I wasn't able to do that that year. And not only that, I didn't have the skill set to even do that job at the highest level. So I had to develop that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we were speaking recently and you were like, uh, you know, we, we, we mastered this craft of short sellers. So many agents are scared of then you were freaking out with that traditional side. You're like, the thing that scared me the most was that traditional business. Cause like, I mean, you built your business off these short sales, you know, right. Which, um, all right. So before we get into, you know, 2012, 2013 and going forward, which, you know, leads to your, your, you guys get your team model in this expansion, which I want to go into. Um, I want you to elaborate on your partnership, right? Cause yeah. you and Fred have such an awesome partnership and, and, um, strategic partnerships can be one of the greatest things on the planet, but if they're done wrong, they can be terrible. So what tips would you give? Cause a lot of real estate agents like to partner, whether it's with their spouse or a friend or whatever it may be, what kind of tips through, through your learning experience would you give, um, you know, to identify the right partner and then maybe some things to make sure like, Hey, if, if these, like, these are red flags, like, you know, a, a no. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. It's like, this is the thing I actually get questions about the most now, or at least there was a period of time where I would get calls once a month, twice a month going, Hey, uh, so-and-so, you know, this, this operating partner, this office or this regional director, or this guy, Josh told me uh, to call you because I'm thinking about partnering with uh, somebody in my real estate business. And they said, you're the only one that they know. 
with a non uh, family membership or spousal partnership that's really tested, you know, tested time and, and won. And so I, I get calls on this a lot. I still probably take six, seven calls a year on this topic. Um, and I love, the, I love the topic. And the reality is this. I think, um, let me just share what's worked for us. Well, let, me, let me start there. I, I think part of it I've discovered was some dumb luck. So I want to be totally straight. I don't think that Fred and I are smarter than everybody else when it comes to partnership. I do think we do some really good things that set us up for success, right? There's things that you can do that give you the best chance of success. And yet, um, yet I think there's a lot of luck involved. And so number one, the one thing we've always been done, we've always done is we've always been really clear on what the arrangement was. Like even in the beginning when we had nothing, like we had 12 listings, Dude, we bro, we drove to Yuma where I, I, I grew up in Yuma, Arizona, which I love. I'm a, I'm a Yuma high criminal. Um, and we drove to Yuma and we had, we had lunch at Chili Pepper, which is the best Mexican food you'll ever find in your life, by the way. Uh, Chili Pepper and Mr. G's. And we drove there, we had lunch, and we literally wrote down every single listing we had that we already had and what was going to be the split on commission. Right, because we had both come out of situations where um, we had some sort of business partnership where we were the ones left holding the bag and, and it wasn't fair to either one of us. And so we were never going to let that happen again. We weren't going to let it stop us from getting into a new partnership, but we weren't going to be the ones that hold, to shoulder all the responsibility. And so we just said, hey, we're going to do this disproportionate on income. We're going to share income disproportionately, but we're going to share expenses right down the middle. And so that means we got to agree on every expense and we're going to agree to how we share that income. And literally we started sharing income in 8515 based on who brought the deal in. So like if Fred brought in a listing, he got 85% of the income. I got 15% of it, but I still paid for 50% of the servicing. Right. So, um, and vice versa. And then what, what, what happened is over time, we just kept inching those numbers closer together and we realized at one point, three years in, that we were causing more problems for our staff. But we loved it because we're so competitive with each other. Like, it's always like, who brought in more this year? Like, to the point where my wife was like, does Fred know that you brought in two more listings this year than he did? Like, we keep track. Even after we started sharing the money, all of the money, 50-50, um, we, st we still kept track. We still keep track of it to this day. In our CRM, like, there's an indicator for Kevin Sphere, Fred Sphere, and then just Sphere like because we're we're competitive about it and that's part of what drives us like we're similar like that and so we just said hey if we bring it in we're going to share the money disproportionate and if uh, we create it because of who we've become as a this team or whatever we're doing then we'll share it 50 50 and here's the deal we never let anything become an argument over it if it if one of us thought it was 50 50 it was freaking 50 50 like there was no like and I literally can't even think of one argument over one check ever. And I'm looking back since 2008, we've probably closed uh, 1,700 to 2,000 houses since then. We've shared that many commission checks and we've not had one argument over one of them. Yeah. And it's just because we're always gonna default to what's right. So um, we were very clear on what the arrangement was. We got really clear on what my strengths were and what his strengths are, even though we didn't actually have that many verbal conversations about it. Like we're similar enough that uh, we typically arrive at the same conclusion. We just normally get there through different routes, right? Like we take different thought processes to get there. And um, we're also, there's just not much ego involved, man. Like I'm not like, I don't care if my name's on it. I don't care if Fred's name's on it. Like it doesn't matter whose idea something was, it matters the result. And I, I think one of the things that's been really key for us, and this is the smart thing that I think that we've done. Um, not the lucky part. The smart part is when there's a decision to be made, we genuinely make the decisions together. When there's a disagreement on a decision, I think that we're really good at going, hey, you clearly feel strong. Like normally one of us feels stronger about it than the other. So we just go with that route because we both feel really safe knowing that if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. We're just going to stop doing it. Like I always like to tell people the two things that we're best at is number one is, is uh, screwing up. And number two is we stop doing that. Like that's the only thing that we do better than screwing up is we stop screwing up and, and learn from it. Yeah. And so because of that, I think it makes us both feel safe in knowing that if I make a decision that, and we go with quote unquote my decision that Fred didn't agree with, 
he's never worried that we're, it's going to sink us because I'm never going to do anything. We're just going to base it off of results and then go the other way if we need to. And so I think that's helped us quite a bit. And uh, I, I think there's times where we know how to divide and conquer based on strengths. And there's most of the times we try to handle everything together as much as we can. And uh, we definitely use, you know, I always joke, like I'm the one that goes out, like I create the mess, I create the relationships and bring it in. And then he, then he sort of makes it work from there, right? So I've got a skill that he, well, while he has the skill, his behavior, like a lot like yours, dude, is not, is, it wouldn't be that. Like his behavior is very similar to yours. Um, and uh, so like we make a very good, like I'm the front guy that's very easy in a relationship or, you know, doesn't matter or a podcast, right? doesn't matter. I'm the guy that can go out and do that. And then when something feels right and we're ready to, to, to implement something or whatever, he's going to be way more heavy into the strategy. And I'm going to kind of give my, my thoughts and overviews, but he's going to be the one who really drives that, but I'm going to drive the front side of it. Does that make sense? Yep. So I think we've just been clear on that and how that partnerships work. Um, the other thing that we always say, we joke around is like, so the reason I know Fred is him and my wife, have known each other since third grade. Like they lived in the same neighborhood in Glendale, Arizona. Like they grew up on the same street or around the corner from each other with this other group of friends. They like, they're still friends to this day, most of them anyways. And um, so he always jokes that he likes my wife better than, than he likes me. And I definitely like his wife better than I like him. Cause she's <laughs> way nicer. And, um, and his kid is, is freaking cute. And so I love his kid and he's got a super strong relationship with my kids. And so I think all that helps, right. That, that like that builds it in. But, uh, the reality is like, I would never let his family down. He would never let my family down. And so I think all that, because we take that, that so seriously, like, dude, it's the way I hear you and John talk about each other when the other person's not around, like truthfully, like we, that we, we feel the same way. And so I think that helps the business partnership. Most of the partnerships I see out there, it's because somebody's got a weakness that they're afraid to hire to, they're afraid to hire around, or they're afraid to attack. And so it's more convenient, or um, they just do a poor job in selecting and ego gets in the way eventually, right? Or it's a mismatch from the beginning where Fred and I aren't really a perfect match, but we're close enough match and ego never gets in the way. So it's just not an issue for us. And I think most importantly, our visions are aligned. Um, one of the things one of my mentors taught me and, uh, and, and you know, it's, he's, he's, uh, he, this guy's the CEO of Keller Williams now. Like he's like, he's like, he understands running a business. And, and, uh, and while we don't have the same relationship today, we did at one time. One of the things he taught me a bunch of years ago was that um, when you've got like a group of investors or part, a partnership, whether it doesn't matter if it's two people or four people or 10, the minute there's more than one uh, vision, it's over. Like there, you just, you can't, you can't coexist. And that's part of the reason I don't own a brokerage anymore is because I realized like, Oh shit, I'm in a situation where I have a different vision than my partners. I need to excuse myself from this because I don't ever want to not be like, I, I'm just not going to do something because contractually I can. Right. I'm just not going to do, I'm just not that dude. I don't need money that bad in my life to where, um, I feel like I need to squeeze everything out of whatever I can. I'm going to, um, I'm going to make sure I can sleep at night, I guess is what I'm saying. And so we've had the same vision uh, and very similar to the same visions for a long time. And I think that is really the glue that holds it together. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, it, it's that congruency on the vision for the business, but also your personal life, you know, right. Um, which you guys seem so congruent in both of those, you know, it's, um, it's, it's awesome, dude. So, all right. So then back to you guys' real estate team, right? So, all right. So you're dialing the traditional side. You guys are, 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 are now creating that success. You're getting this dialed in on the traditional side. Um, kind of walk us through the journey that led you to, you know, cause obviously, like you said, I mean, you're, you're working with all listings. He's working with all the buyers. I mean, a hundred, what'd you say? 120, hundred, whatever transactions. 130 deals in two, yeah, 2013. Yeah, between two agents, right? I mean, 60 a year, let's just say, or, or Kevin, you know, 65, Fred, 60. I mean, I probably did 75 <laughs> of them or whatever. Maybe yeah. even 30. She's got to give that little, uh, yeah. that competitiveness, but, uh, um, you know, but then obviously, you know, right, you start growing that again, you're outsourcing and not outsourcing, but, but delegating to staff and developing the team. You'll kind of walk us through how, 
how you guys sort of developing that team and then what leads to um, cause I'm sure you guys had this conversation of like, dude, we could, we could just expand the hell out of the Phoenix or go this expansion model um, or do both, which it seems like you guys are, are doing now. Um, yeah. um, you know, going deep and going wide is, is we talk about. So kind of, kind of walk us through that journey, dude. Yeah, man. So I'll, I'll be honest, like in 2013, right, it was survival mode. And also a lot of it was like big fucking chip on my shoulder. Like we got to prove that we, we are, we know what we're doing and this business hasn't passed us up just because it's not short sales anymore. Right. So we do that. We, uh, we figure out how to sell real estate. Um, but neither one of us are happy with the business and we're, we're genuinely like now we're at the point where we're not having fun with it. We're making decent money, but we're not having fun with it. And so we're, we're having these conversations about what are we going to do? And we kind of, we, uh, we started a, a new model. Like we knew we needed some help because we couldn't just have Fred driving around the, the Valley with buyers six days a week. And so we hired a, an agent and we put her on a salary legitimately put it on our salary in 2013 and we just figured you know the reality was is in the past with our buyers team they they didn't really generate more business not substantially more business than what fred and i brought in because of who we were with our relationships and our, our referrals and stuff like that and so we just said why don't we just pay someone a flat salary and uh and to this day we're still in business with this with this with her and she's amazing she sells anywhere from 50 to 75 homes a year kicks ass i love her to death um i happen to have known her since way back in the day like i think her and i met in 2000 2001 we worked together at uh at conseco slash green tree finance which uh ge ultimately bought but so she got into she got a real estate license we brought her on and she started working as a salary buyer's agent but because she was on salary, she got to do everything in the business. Like she learned how, how the listing appointments went. Like she learned how to handle the listing appointments for short sales. She learned how everything happened on the transactional side. Like she was basically a paid intern for 40, 50, 60 hours a week, some weeks, and she worked with buyers. And so that was cool. It was great. And to this day, I think she's a, an amazing agent in part because of how much she got to learn that first year. Yeah, but so we hit 2014 and here we are, we're doing okay. Like, you know, we're selling houses. We figured it out. I now know how to take a listing and I don't care if Russell Shaw's the competing agent, I'm going to kick their ass. Like, I don't care. I'm going to beat anybody for a listing, but that is no longer fun enough for me. Like it's no longer good enough to call the other agent and say, Hey man, your appointments have been canceled. Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones actually signed paperwork with me this morning, but I'm gonna let you show your buyers first, but you don't have an appointment at two o'clock anymore. Like that was fun for a while. And then it wasn't fun for me. And so we started poking around. And at this time I find myself in a, in, in relationship with uh, Brett Tanner, who, you know, and uh, Ben Kenny, who, you know, and Brian Gubernick, who I'd been friends with for years uh, over the short sale days. And, and uh, I talked to, I, I start talking to all them because all I know is I've got this business and it looks good and the money's pretty good, but it, I don't like it. It has me, I, it owns me. I don't own it. And that, that doesn't sit with me and it doesn't sit with Fred and we're legitimately going, do we stay in real estate or maybe do we just do real estate part time? Cause we know we can sell a hundred houses a year part time and then go find another business to own. And we just said, no, we're either going to do things really big or we're not going to do things at all because we thought back to the mission statement we wrote in 2008, which was produce extraordinary results, influence people and impact lives. And we weren't doing any of that selling 150 houses a year 160 houses a year whatever we got to in 2014 and so we had some moments where I sat down with Tanner man and I said dude Tanner I want you to sell me on your model and he said what do you mean I said sell me on your business model your team looks different than mine like forget that I'm the agent on my team who takes the listings just show me your model versus my model which I ran the traditional MREA model million dollar real estate agent the difference was my buyer's agent's got a salary right that's the difference and so, so Brett sketches it out for me one day. We're sitting in a conference room in our office and for like an hour, just my mind is blown. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And so I run back and I take the notes that Brett and I drew out together and I show Fred, I'm like, this is what we're looking for, dude. And so we have some conversations with Gubernick at the same time. And then uh, Ben Kenny, who's a, who's, a, who's a dear friend slash mentor of ours, had, had been bugging us for a while, like, dude, come up and, and hang out with me for a couple of days and let me help you with your business. 
And, uh, and so we go up to Seattle or Bellingham, I should say. And, uh, and we stay at Ben's house for like three nights and we shadow every member of his team essentially for, for two or three days. And he just sort of does this little internship thing with us where he's like, okay, go watch this department for an hour, come back, tell me what you learned. And then he would like give us this little life lesson right there, you know, this business lesson on the spot. And then we get together at the end of each day or, you know, in the middle of the day for like lunch and then again for dinner and be like, what'd you learn today? And he just, he's just coaching us. Like he's mentoring us. He's being a friend to us because he knows we hate our business. And, uh, and we start telling him, well, dude, you know, I talked to Tanner and I talked to Gubernick and, and here's my plans. And, and what do you think about this? And he starts helping us refine it. And uh, so we are like, we got this, we got this. Like we come up with this plan that's kind of a combination really of at the time, Brett Tanner's model and, and uh, Brian Gubernick's model and, and Ben Kenny's model and how they're running their real estate teams. And, and what we found is a bunch of other teams also had a similar model and they were all selling significantly more homes than we were. And we we're like, we're going like, I don't get it. I'm, you know, like, I know enough, like I should be able to get this figured out. And so we just, we got the new model. We went home and started executing. This is where it gets weird, right? Because at the same time, in this conversation with this amazing guy in Denver, Colorado, who to this day is, is our business partner there. And, um, and I can't tell you how thankful and grateful I am for, for Aaron Lebovic, who I'm in business with and have been since September 1st of 2014. So shortly after I got back from Ben Kinney's house, Aaron's a guy I met teaching short sales way back in the day in 2010 or 2011 when he owned, uh, I guess he still owns part of a software company that sells information on like foreclosures and uh, foreclosure filings and stuff like that. He's selling data to investors and real estate agents. And he's looking for a change and he's, re he's ready to get into residential real estate. Even though he's been around real estate his whole life, he's not actually sold houses. And uh, the other part of the story I'll back up to is 2011, before Fred and I got sidetracked with this job, um, we were actually looking at expanding and that came out of a conversation with our business coach who was challenging us on how to improve our price point. And like, dude, bro, the truth is I wasn't just, I'm just not going to go to paradise Valley and start selling houses. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going to, you're probably not either. And, um, like, and so we're like, okay. And even if we did, we might sell one or two a year, that's not going to make the average of 150 or 250 houses go up that high. So what could we do? Well, out of that came, we could sell real estate in San Diego. And so we were going down the path of like expanding our business and whatever the hell that meant into San Diego. And then we got sidetracked with this thing in 2012. And so we were like, maybe we should pick that back up. So here it is, August of 2014, we decide um, that we're going to change our model completely. Like we're going to go to this, uh, what I call sales agent model, right? Where agents are allowed to take listings and buyers. And we're going to start succeeding through other people rather than ourselves. And um, I'm going to take a step back in, in net income so that way I can grow a business and hopefully take a big step forward in the next few years. And then we decided to also do that in Denver at the same time. Because we're like, well, we're already generating leads. Like, I mean, too, with part of the story I didn't tell is I didn't spend a dime in 2013. Like, we had to cut our budgets back. We didn't spend a dime on lead generation in all of 2013. We still sold 131 houses. And so we're like, we know how to generate leads and I know how to take listings now. And I know we already knew it. We already had good systems for buyers. And this guy, Aaron wants to be in real estate. And literally we happened, this came up because we're in a meeting in Colorado with our buddy. You might know him. His name is Leo Sanchez. And at the time, Leo worked for a hedge fund called Waypoint. And Leo was head of acquisitions for them. And he was, uh, we had sold him a bunch of our listings in, in Phoenix the previous couple of years. And uh, he was up in Denver trying to help them buy more homes in Denver. And it's, it's been a struggle there. Like they've been in a seller's market for years, like super tight. And uh, so we're trying to help them out through our relationships that we have in Denver. And one of those people was Aaron. I knew that Aaron didn't sell real estate, but he's a very connected guy in that real estate industry because of all of his time with the uh, software company. And so we're in the room and we've been through, I don't know, four, five, maybe six meetings uh, of trying to introduce Leo to guys that carry a lot of listings so he can get to inventory for his company waypoint. And um, Leo literally says jokingly while we were kind of done with this meeting, he goes, 
this would just be so much easier if you guys sold real estate in Denver. And we all like look at him like we're laughing. And Leo likes to take credit for Group 46 Town Expansion now as a joke. And uh, Aaron legitimately looks up. He goes, oh, if you guys were going to do that, I'd want to talk to you about it because I'm, I'm definitely going to get into residential real estate sales. So I would totally talk to you guys about partnering together somehow if you, if you wanted to do that. We're like, well, shit, like the light bulb went off, right? And so here we are. We're going to not only change our model, but now we're going to do it in another city too, in another whole other state with a different contract. And we're going to try to take everything we have in Phoenix that's worked and give it all to Aaron and see if we can make it work there too. So that's, I mean, that's kind of how, that was literally the start of expansion. Um, so that was, you know, we go through a couple month process and, um, it, you know, the meeting with Aaron is probably back in more like June. Uh, now that I think about it, because uh, we went to a class together in August, you know, we had a couple interviews and meetings. He flew to Phoenix. We flew to Denver. We spent a lot of time together figuring out this relationship because Fred and I knew if we're going to get into a heavy relationship like that, it was going to work. Um, and, uh, and Aaron was the guy. And, and so we did it in September of 2014. He moves his license over to an office that we had a good relationship with the owner of. And, um, and we started this, uh, this thing called expansion while simultaneously flipping the switch in Phoenix to a sales agent model, taking our now two agents who were on a salary, putting them on a, um, putting them on full commission and going, by the way, I'm going to teach you how to take listings too. And you're going to, you know, you're going to make a lot more money this way. And then I started hiring more agents here and we switched over to this new model and we just happened to do it the exact same time we started expanding. So then would you say that the key to expansions and having success with expansion, because a lot, I see a lot of people that are like, you know, oh, hey, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I love to visit Carlsbad. So I'm going to start a team there and expand there just because they love the location, you know, right? Uh, w w would you say it's the success is on picking the right location or is it just heavily upon having that right person? It's the people, bro. So like expansion is easy. <laughs> Theoretically, it's the people, right? So it's two things. It's, it has nothing to do with the location. I don't want to say nothing. Location is so minimized because um, there are market ins and outs and, you know, market norms in different places where it could be friendlier to you. Um, but it's 100% the most important thing is the people. And so when we go somewhere, it doesn't matter if we go somewhere tomorrow, like we're in Nashville, Tennessee. Like why are we in Nashville? Like that's not on the West Coast. I don't have a desire to be in the South or the East Coast or anything. Um, we're in Nashville because the person and that person happens to happens to be very close with us, and she worked with us in Phoenix for three plus years, and uh, and she happens to be Fred's sister in law now, but she wasn't when I first hired her when she was a kid. Uh, I mean, like I hired her in two thousand nine, literally to answer phones when we were heavy short sales. She's just answering phones for from listing agents or buyer's agents. And uh, here we are finding ourselves in Nashville. Now we've got this amazing team, this guy Joe, uh, along with Stephanie and these other great people that they've built up in our, of, of, our, of our location in Nashville. But it's 100% about the people. Like, I'm never going to go a place because I want to be in a place. Now, we've tried to do that. It's a mistake. But even in times we've done that, there was a person tied to it as well. Uh, we just may have put too much emphasis on the location, right? So some of our mistakes come through that. It's all about the people. If I don't have the right person, it doesn't matter. I'm not going anywhere else if I can if I don't have the right person. Like as soon as I find the next Joe Ubre or Mike Turnquist, who is our leader in the uh, Central Coast of California, or Aaron Lebovic, doesn't that when I find that next person, that's when we can expand again. But until then, you know, it's like Sarah Parks in Yuma, Arizona, which is my hometown. Like we're crushing it in Yuma right now. Like what are we six months in, seven months in now, and onto our eighth month. And we're starting to really gain momentum. But Sarah's a great leader. She's a great person to be in business with. And we've really built some momentum together. And so the thing is, it's all about the people. Like, there's other reasons why people fail at expansion. I don't think location's really it. Um, but I do think that is one of the mistakes people make. Yeah. And what, what I love about this, dude, is there's a lot of great team leaders, a lot of great, great real estate agents and team leaders but their weakness is business operations, building out the systems and processes. So it gives that person that's a great team leader, you know, right? That is a great real estate agent. 
um, you know, it's almost like a franchise. Like you can just plug in, partner with, with, you know, great operators and business owners like you guys, right. Um, still go out there and, and be an owner and, and have your, your, and lead this team with the proven system behind it. And it creates a win-win if they get plugged in with the right people, you know? So I think it's brilliant, dude. So, um, can you walk us through like some of that maybe, you know, that, I mean, we all hear, I think the expansion term thrown around, but how does it really work? You know, right? Like when, when we, when we break down your operations, um, and you don't have to disclose things, you know, I don't know if you are comfortable, not comfortable disclosing the splits. I won't press you to disclose anything you're not comfortable with, but as far as the overall operations, like I know your home base is here in Arizona, um, where you have all of your assistants, you know, right. Then the team leaders and then the agents, um, are always different locations, but can you just walk us through the overall yeah. model and how it works just to give everybody an idea? Yeah. So, so here's what, it, let me tell you first what it feels like, and then I'll tell you kind of, um, kind of those other pieces. So it feels like no difference to us for the, um, like anybody else that has a team that maybe like there's two offices in their office, like maybe they're in a local brokerage, right? And they've got offices down the hall from each other or even next door to each other. So it literally feels like the, the agents, right? The salespeople are just, instead of in the office next door or down the hall, they're like down the road or they're across the state line, right? So that's what it feels like. Now, what happens, so what we do is we're different, even in our own world, in an expansion, we're definitely like, we're the guys that do things differently. So a lot of people in expansion will be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we offer full, full administrative support, but they don't. They really don't. Like, in their terms, they offer full support. However, like in our office, like if I, if I to show you our office, like to set it up for you, in our hub, we have got, uh, we have got people that are licensed in every single state that we operate in. Right. So our transaction managers, the people that are on the closing team that help the, the contracts go from contract to close and help get the listings, everything like they're all in one office. So the people that are licensed in Colorado that handle all the Colorado transactions, they're here in Phoenix and they do a great job and they're licensed and their license hangs at a brokerage in Colorado. Right. And, uh, and so that's here. Um, we've got an amazing staff. I, I firmly believe we have the best administrative team and support team on the planet when it comes to real, the real estate business. Like the amount of things that they do, the amount of things that they've negotiated and helped, helped our clients and our agents with is like out of control. So they're here. The other thing that we have here is we've got the rest of our support staff and that looks like operations and on our operations staff, we kind of have what we call sales support and business support. So sales support is we've got <clears throat> two people that are here, hundred percent here dedicated to agents, help them get onboarded, help the tools and the systems that we use, right? Anything that an agent would touch. And we, we use quite a bit tech, of technology, which I'll go into in a minute. So they handle all of that, a request for a dialer's license, a request for the, you know, Boomtown account's got to be created, things like that. Leads got to be turned on or transferred. Like that all happens from here in one location and uh, in, from our support staff, our sales support staff. And then we've got a business operations team that handles things more like the financial side of the business and those kinds of ins and outs, like HR and things like that. We've got a technology team, so a couple of like three software developers that are amazingly talented um, that are here on staff because we've got some of our own internal technology that we've developed that we use both from a data standpoint um, to get, gain insights into our business as well as um, to use from a strategy standpoint and create tools and, um, and bells and whistles, if you will, for our agents, things to make their jobs and lives easier as well. So we've got a technology staff here. We've got a marketing staff here that we've started developing uh, marketing plans for our agents to like, we're, we're still in really infant stages of that, but developing marketing plans and platforms for agents to go out uh, and market to their sphere easier and better with pre-done pieces and marketing um, and branding that's sort of done for them and then done in conjunction with them. And then we've also got um, performance coaching in-house. And so what we've done is we've partnered with a, a gentleman who I actually met like the week before I got licensed in 07 uh, in a real estate office. I met him and stayed in relationship with him. His name is Eric Kelly. And I've, I've always admired Eric and Finally, our, our careers, you know, our paths crossed, right? Where our businesses were and where our lives were. Now, Eric is a guy that 
has built a huge business based off of referrals from clients, repeat clients, um, and his sphere of influence. It's massive. And it's, he makes it look so easy. Like he'll sell 10, $15 million a year, like in his sleep, like one day a week type of guy. Like he's amazing. This guy is the ultimate relationship connector. And so he's great at that. But the thing he's truly passionate about is helping people perform at a high level. So he's literally here dedicated um, to our company and helping our agents grow their business. And so he helps our new agents who get through our training process to then get into a coaching accountability performance relationship. And then, and then he's also got relationships in small groups and one-on-ones with people who are already very productive that want to go to the next level and whatever that next level might be, whether that's like a time thing or a more money thing, how to leverage better, whatever that is, he's there to guide them through it. I mean, this guy that's been in business for a long time. Like he understands not just the real estate business, but the relationship business and the sales business. And so he's here on staff and this dude is on the phone 40 hours a week. And when he's not on the phone with, with agents helping their business, he's designing plans for them and he's helping them support them with their uh, sphere of influence. And he's thinking of ways to impact their lives and their business. And so that's a little bit more of a glance of what our, what our hub looks like. And then it just so happens that the salespeople happen to sit in different offices around different cities and different States, but they're all connected through technology, right? We've got our own platform that we use. We call it our app. Um, of course, we all use, we all use the same CRM. That's all loaded together. Um, you know, they're all synced together. So we can support that. The leads are generated from here. Everything back end administrative is done from here, except for, those appointment, the phone calls to set the appointments, the actual appointments with buyers and sellers, um, that's all done on the ground, if you will, in different locations. Everything else is done from this one location, and it's our job. I firmly believe it's it's Group Forty Six Ten's position is that we're a, we're we're a platform for real estate agents to succeed through, and. Um, we're just here to support them build their own business. And it's not like a one size fits all. So like, so like when someone joins us, it's not about my goals. It's not about the goal of that local leader uh, in that region. It's about what are their, what, what are their goals and how can we help them get more in their life? And we just use our platform to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, dude. You know, and, and you know, we went to, something similar over the past years, you know, not doing near as good of a job as, as you guys do with it, but, you know, removing my, you know, it's not the Joshua Smith show. It's not the Kevin Kaufman show, you know, right. And I always sit there and tell it's same thing, right. We're, right. We're, we're the support, you know, a, a, a training back in systems to help you grow your business, brand them. And you know, that's important to agents, man. I think it's huge dude. And, and you guys do such a brilliant job. And those that are watching and listening, when Kevin says, you know, with their support, like, dude, they do everything, you know, right? Like, like my transaction coordinators are very involved, but the agent still has to jump in and, and get involved. Like if the appraisal comes in low or like to, to do a repair inspection notice, whatever, like Kevin, you guys take all this off the plate. Like your agents don't see the inspection report. They're not negotiating. Like, dude, they're just conducting appointments and, and negotiating contracts. Yeah. Increase yeah, their capacity massively. Yeah, that increases their capacity. I believe it helps grow their business as well because um, the truth is, I believe, right or wrong, it doesn't matter, it's my belief that the person that does that a couple hundred times is more equipped to do it than the person that does that two times a month or four times a month if they're great, six times a month if they're great at sales, right? Um, and so the person that's, I'm gonna say a little more steady and, and not, you know, is dealing with a lot, but is a little more of a dot the I, cross the T type of person, to me is a little more equipped to do that. And I believe, number one, it increases the capacity for the salesperson. And number two, and more important, it creates a better customer experience to that end buyer or seller. And since our business is so heavily relies on repeat and referral business, we believe that's the way for us to go. And, uh, and it definitely creates other challenges in scaling but we also believe the benefit outweighs the outweighs the downside of it. Yeah, love it, dude. And then um, with the team leader that's in the different locations now, is the team leader because I mean, you're, you're you guys have a lot of training, virtual training that you do. You've got this uh, coach that's coaching them. You know, virtual or not, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it's it's just like any other coach. You know, we're not in yep. the same room with our coaches. So you're providing this coaches, but then is is the team leader? 
because yeah, the question that a lot of people have, or I know that I would have with this is, is that there's, you know, with culture and the energy in that office. And, and if you have an agent that's in this state all alone, you know, right. Um, how, how are you somewhat trying to still facilitate that energy and culture? Is that where the team leader comes in? Is there still meetings with that team leader and things that you guys Yeah, man, this is such a challenge, bro. This is the hard part of the business is there's, I don't even have like a really great answer for you. I'll tell you what we do, what we think works, and then we know what, what doesn't work, right? Or in the downside of it. And the truth is we're still tweaking this every day. And we're trying new things as recently as this month to make sure that we provide the value and the connection to that person, to that agent who signed up for it, right? Like I firmly believe like I have this duty. Now, not everyone's gonna get it and, and that's okay. I can't force everyone to get it, but I'm gonna work tirelessly to make sure that they know that I'm here to support them and that I provide the tools for them to be successful. And, and that they, so they feel the love, so to speak, of the support of the network. And so number one, I think that's key for us is, we, is we, you gotta do things in person. So there is a couple times a year, like we've got one coming up in, uh, in April, we'll do it in Denver, because uh, we move this one around every year where we call it our master, Group 4610 Masterminds. And that's just inviting all of our agents to one location. We put on a, a day event, and it's all education based. It's all about building the business for them, their business, their goals, not mine, not my agenda, but how can I help you? And um, you do that in person, right? You gotta mix everyone together, that builds culture. We do another event in Tempe every year. We call it the Think Bigger Conference, which is like a two day event. We bring in speakers like Michael Burnoff has come in and helped on the NLP and kind of human communication side of things a few times we've had. Um, Dustin Runyon, who, by the way, bro, you got to get Dustin Runyon on this. Um, he, I'll, I'll connect you offline. Um, Dustin is, uh, I can't even, I won't even talk about how grateful I am for Dustin because I'll just start crying. So Dustin's amazing. Um, and then like different like practitioners, right? So Corinne Wynn, who you know Corinne, she's come in and taught a class along with her daughter who is uh, freaking adorable. Uh, ran scripts, right, with our whole team, with like 60 real estate agents last year is amazing or the year before. And so we'll bring in like people that are practitioners or a guy like Ronnie Doss, who is also amazing at uh, leadership and mindset training. So we try to mix in leadership, mindset, culture building stuff along with tactical in the trenches like this is how you do things right and uh, Matt Fedek has been someone who's been in to talk about listings before um, Nick Waldner out of Maryland's come in and done stuff you know Nick and so um, we, we just try to do that in person a couple times a year and then in addition to that you know we try to get out and see uh, different locations once a year or something like that it's hard to go to all the locations now you know at first I wanted to do it four times a year uh, in every location and it's just not sustainable if you're going to grow big and so we do a lot more things where people come here to us and we do events together in person and um and then we do a lot of stuff like this with zoom right and uh weekly meetings where we actually run them from the hub now from here and so they're connected to me and fred and eric uh the performance coach and the, and, and the staff here in the hub and we've got a very vibrant and active facebook group and you know the reality is one of those people on that administrative team or excuse me the support team is called an agent services coordinator man that's all about making sure the agents have what they need like you have a problem i'm here to help here's the phone number you call here's the email address you email to and if you need help her, her name happens to be Shelby. Shelby's going to be here. Shelby's going to make you feel warm and welcome and make sure you get the help you need, whether that's going to come from the development team or the operations team or something she can handle personally or if it needs to come to Fred and I, it doesn't matter. She sort of plays point guard with that and then make sure that the support is there. So I think you got to have all these out, like you got to have these things where you mix around in person and then we have all these outgoing touches, right? And we mess up on that, dude. We fall short. Like, the reality is, is I guess if you ever did an AVA, Josh, there's this thing where it me measures on the uh, activity vector analysis AVA where it measures your management competencies. And my guess is that, like, rewarding people is going to be something that's harder for you. Not, like, hard in the skill set, but hard in the sense it takes more of your energy. Same for me and Fred. Like, we have to consciously think about it. And so um, we're consciously thinking about it. And luckily now we're at a point where the, where the company has grown enough where there's more money to pay more people to help with that stuff, to help grow and build the culture of that. And that's why there's people like um, – like an agent services coordinator, and there's a three-person support staff really for that entire operations team, plus the development team, plus the performance coaching department and the marketing department, right? 
all in addition to the transaction support. And that's all in the name of like, how do I give you more support? Because the truth is, bro, we suck at it. Like Fred and lead me and Fred to it. We suck. Cause I don't actually need anybody to, to pat me on the back. Like I, I need to just hang out and have a beer with you every once in a while or have a cup of coffee with you every once in a while. And I feel connected and I realize that not everybody operates that way. And so we have to be better about that. And, uh, and so we're working hard at that. And sometimes we do good and sometimes, you know, we screw up and sometimes people see the value and sometimes they don't, but I sleep well at night knowing that I've, I've worked my ass off to provide that value and I'm going to keep doing that every day. And the people that, um, that stick with us for the long run, and it's really cool now because we've been in business with this new model for, for a number of years. And so we've got a handful of people that have been with us for a long time. And, uh, it's so cool to see the, the ownership of like, dude, this is our thing. And so like when somebody doesn't get it, like somebody comes in and they just don't buy in, right? Cause they don't believe in it. They don't buy in. And so they opt out and they say bad things about us because they didn't want to buy in and actually do the system. Um, the people that are here are like, man, what's your problem? Like you realize you're the same exact opportunity I do. And, uh, and that's cool. Go somewhere else, but shut up. And so, um, it's really cool to see that develop and grow and it's fucking hard because we're dealing with people and it's a lot of people. Yeah. And that's the, the people side of this business or any business is hard. It's, it's just, it's just a challenge. And when I say hard, not like, Oh, I don't want to do it. I just mean, it's hard. Like that's the challenging part. Like thinking of marketing strategies, executing on them. That shit's easy. Generating leads. That's easy. Coming up with value for a massive amount of people. That's where it gets to be tricky. Yeah, I'll say one thing about, you know, about you and the commonality that I see with truly successful team leaders, you know, right? They don't have this attitude of, you know, how can I get more and, and make more money off of my people, whatever. They, they, they have a, this mindset shift, just like you do and Fred does, of being obsessed of giving value to your people to help you, you know, their quality of life and their business grow and expand, you know, and I, and I love it dude, because I mean, you do so much fucking business. It's insane. Everybody else out there is like, shit, this guy is awesome. I can't believe this, but you feel like you suck, you know, right? Like, like I love it because it's like never satisfied. We've always got to improve. We always got to grow. And, and it's so amazing. Um, so, so Kevin, real quick, man, I mean, it, those that are watching, listening, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's a, a team leader that's struggling on the business operations side, but they know they're a great team leader. They think they might be a fit for your expansion model, or maybe it's an agent that has no interest in being a team leader, you know, but they, they just want to pour into your systems that you have. Where's the best place to get in touch with you um, on that side of things uh, to learn more about 4610 and see if they're a candidate for it? Yeah, bro, I appreciate that. Uh, Kevin at Group 4610 is my email address. It comes to me. I check it. I'm one of those weirdos. Like, I don't let other people read my email. I probably should, but I don't. Um, so that, and, uh, you know, obviously the, you mentioned the Facebook group, which, which we'll talk about next level agents. Um, you can find me in there if, if we're not already connected on Facebook, Instagram, I'm pretty active on like Facebook and Instagram. And like, uh, quite honestly, I kind of go to Snapchat and Twitter to play. Like I'm on Snapchat cause my niece who I'm very close with and, and have a really close bond with, it was on Snapchat for years. And so I got on there to just hang out with her. And now, uh, you know, everyone's on Snapchat. And so um, you can find me there too, I'm sure, by searching my, my name. Uh, but Instagram is Kevin underscore Kaufman. And, uh, this, and then Facebook, I got to be honest, I don't even know my Facebook URL right now. But find me, just go to the Next Level Agents Facebook group. I'll be the one to, to approve you anyways. And so um, you, could, you could just find me there and I appreciate it. Or Kevin at group4610.com. I'd love to have conversations with people, um, whether that's here locally and I, like I'm, I'm in the saddle, bro. Like I do the, I do the recruiting and selecting for us in Arizona at this point. And I'm, I love doing that because I love being in the trenches with agents and talking about their business and helping them grow to different places. And the thing I love that our business allows to do is it's actually built and we've attracted a lot of new agents and, and we like that because everyone's, everyone was a new agent once, right? We talked about this last week in LA. And so I like, I have this heart for new agents yet our system is actually designed to help productive agents get more productive and people who have had a struggle building a team um, and keeping it together. It's designed to help them because we've got those back end systems uh, 
fairly dialed as far as they get dialed in the real estate business. And uh, so it's actually set up for those people. So I'd love to have those conversations. I handle all the actual direct stuff in Arizona. And then I, you know, initial conversations for anybody outside of Arizona as well. I'd love to love to connect and, and talk about what that might look like, or if I can help just in your business period, I'm, I'm always down. Yep, love it, dude. And then I know recently you did a a boot camp here locally in Phoenix. We taught other team leaders, successful team leaders that were looking to get in the expansion model. Um, you know, and again, invite them into your office, and and yeah. you know, I mean, it was just in depth boot camp. And is that something that you're doing more of, and and that people that are maybe thinking about expansion could still attend, or or is that just a one time deal? So we've done that like three times total. Uh, I'll be straight. We were, we thought we would do it twice this year because it's a lot to put together. Um, Cause this is like an in-depth detailed like systems. And this is really all systems. So it's not as sexy cause it can get detailed. Like you can tell, you can ask Chet Black, like Chet Black was there at our last one in December. I think we're, we'll do one this December because uh, we like to do it once a year. We like to update it, you know, and show people like, here's what's different from last year and it's expensive. So not many people will actually even invest three grand in their, in their selves and their business to show up. But you know, we'll have a room of anywhere from 15 to 30 people show up and it's literally a two day deep dive into the systems that have worked in our expansion. And the truth is there's other expansion training out there and I'm just going to be straight. Like it's not most of it, like 99% of it is based off a of theory and not actually what's worked and what hasn't worked and, and actually been done by people who've skinned their teeth and, 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 uh, and have the bruises to show for it. Like it's, it's like it's textbook stuff which is like a good starting place. But the problem is, is if you don't teach people like what really works and show them what doesn't work as well, you set them up for failure. And I'm not okay with that. Like I'm not okay setting people up for failure. That's why I hate, I hate stage talk. I hate people that only show you the highlights. Like I don't hate those people. I just hate that talk because um, when you, when you don't connect to what actually doesn't work in the business, and you, you talk about just the, the results of what is working, you, you set people up for failure by not giving them the whole story. And so it takes two full days and we kind of give the whole story of what goes on. So we'll probably do one in December. Um, we're, we love teaching and giving back. That one's just a little more of a time suck on us. So it's not like we don't do that one because we can make a lot of money off of it. We, we do that one because we do like to give back and we like to help people think bigger. And the reality is, is the more we teach, the better we get in our own business and it forces us to stay sharp, right? And so on that thing, what we'd like to do is we'd ultimately like to make something where we can deliver it maybe electronically or maybe through a webinar type of deal in the future. But the truth is we're just not ready for that today. Uh, we're just not equipped for that anyways right now, but we will be in the future. But we'll do a live in-person event probably in Tempe, Arizona this December um, as long as we can you know, put 10 people in the room to make it worth our time to actually do it. Um, we'll, we'll do that. And, and I'm sure that we will. Um, we, we thought we'd do it in May, but we just can't. Our schedules are too tight right now. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be there in December, man. Um, I, I got no reason not to be down the street from me. And, and, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's comical to me, you know, right? Like, you know, three grand, right? So those that are watching and listening, I mean, imagine this, you get to spend three grand to go spend two days and see the world-class systems and operations, everything, from dudes that have spent millions creating this and you get it for three grand, right? Uh, I just, to me, it's, it's, it's silly, right? Like it's you're hard alone, right? In their 20 grand for it. Like it's, it's insane, dude. And, and, you know, I got to imagine, um, I don't know if I'll ever go the expansion route or not, but I'm always looking to improve my team locally. And, and I got to imagine what's in there is, is just any, any team leader that's looking to take your business to the next level. I got to imagine that's, that's a room you absolutely want to be in. Yeah, you know, John's been on me to change the name of that class because the truth is it's not just for expansion, it's for growing your business, right? You, so people hear the word expansion, they think I got to go to a new market. And the truth is it's, it's, you, you could just use those same tools for expansion in your same market and making your business grow bigger. And uh, I mean, look, like, you know, the reality is, is like if you can't, I, I probably invested three grand in my business the whole the time we've been on this webinar, right? <laughs> like if you can't take out two days of your business and a couple grand, like what the, like, what are you, like, how small are you thinking? Like, and I'm not saying that like come to my course, but like whether it's a grand to take your Joshua Smith's 90 day boot camp or whatever, Kevin Kaufman and Fred Weaver's like expansion boot camp for two days, it doesn't matter. Like if you don't take the time to learn and invest, like 
I don't know. Like I, I just, I have this thing. I had a mentor teach me that like, if you're not willing to spend money and spend your time to go after what you say you really want, like you must not really want it. Yep. Yep. And then I know Kevin uh, mentioned the name earlier, but next level, next level agents, right? Yes, so, sir. so it used to be real estate agents who want real results uh, Rolls right off the tongue. Uh, along and now it's next level agents, but I'm telling you guys right now, and we'll have links right below um, all of this stuff, Kevin's email, all Kevin's uh, social media sites. You can connect with him, his website, all, all of this stuff will be in the show notes, wherever you're watching, listening, but get inside that group, right? It's, it is by far, in my opinion, the best group for real estate agents. There's no, like, these are guys are the only dudes that give value without selling anything, you know, right? I mean, it is true value. Um, and uh, it's ran by uh, three of the top team leaders out there. So uh, make sure that you join that 100% for sure. Um, next thing I just want to, I know we're going really long on time here, but um, I know you also got um, a big event that you're putting on. Um, those that are watching this will have time to book tickets to because I, I believe it's next few months um, that's up in Vegas. Kind of talk to us about that and where people can go to, to get uh, tickets for that. Yeah, definitely, bro. I appreciate that. And I still, I'm going to corner you so I can, uh, so we can talk about this as well uh, offline, but so yeah, May 18th, uh, we're actually, so my business partner, Fred, who we talked about, and then our partner in this Facebook group is Cody Gibson. So Cody runs a massive expansion team too, uh, much bigger than my organization from a people standpoint. And um, Cody is awesome. He's a great guy. We just had this idea, like we should have our own Facebook group and give value. And so that's where this was born out of like one Saturday morning, I created a Facebook group. I couldn't think of a good name. So I called it real estate agents who want real results. And uh, finally, 15 months later, uh, like three weeks ago, we changed the name to Next Level Agents. So you could go to Next Level Agents and on May 18th in Las Vegas, Nevada, we're having a one day event, action packed. Basically my goal here is to, not my goal, like what will happen at this event? Well, it will be the single best real estate education event in the entire country this year. Like hands down, that's my guarantee to you who show up. So some of the speakers we've already announced are, um, Cody will obviously be speaking there. He's amazing. If you haven't heard Cody, like you got to hear Cody. Cody's amazing. He's got such a crazy background and on business and in real estate that he's got so much to give. So Cody, uh, via Williams out of Seattle, who runs a massive team, um, has moved her price point to double over the last couple of years. You know, she does 70, $80 million a year now. Uh, I think she'll be hitting a hundred this year. She'll be speaking. Um, John Sheplack will be speaking. You got Travis Tom. Travis, if you don't know, runs the single largest uh, and most successful Facebook ad agency for real estate in our industry. He's actually uh, on, does some super top secret stuff. I don't even think I can tell you about with Facebook um, because he's so good at ads in real estate specific. So he's coming to do a, uh, to a session for us. I'm going to announce a few other speakers. i uh, been announcing one a week and announced Travis yesterday. And so um, John via Travis, Cody, um, you know, the reality is Fred and I might talk if there's enough time left over, but like, like the, the speakers that I haven't announced yet, like are, they're ridiculous. They're off the chain. Everyone's just going, I love your community. I love what you're doing here. And so I want to give back too. And so how can I speak? And that's, it's been pretty cool to see that. So one day event, uh, in Las Vegas, Friday, May 18th, I'll, I'll shoot you a link so we can just add it below. You could just go to the group and, and click on the events tab too. So facebook.com forward slash next level agent. Um, that's where you can find the link to the uh, whatever system we're using to sell tickets to it. But it, it's like 200 bucks or maybe 250 bucks for a full day. Like this will be like 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. No lunch break type of day. Like we're fucking going hard for one full day of education with the best of the best in the industry. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, yeah, you guys. So again, all below will be all, all Kevin's contact information. Make sure that you check all of that out. Um, make sure you get in that Facebook group because it is, it is gnarly, dude. So last question, because I, I know we're running long on time. Um, if the Kevin today, knowing everything that you know right now, could go back and have a conversation with the younger version of yourself uh, self in 2007 and give yourself a couple pieces of advice, knowing everything you know now, that you feel it to just fast forward your trajectory to success, what would those two pieces of advice look like? Man, that's a great question, bro. Can I share like a side note? Because you so like my niece, the one that I'm super close with, she's a senior in high school now. And she we did a FaceTime yesterday so she could interview me about my business for her economics class. 
and she asked me about mistakes and what you would do differently. And I was like, oh, this is like the best interview, even though it was only 15 minutes. And, and you know, like you said, you do a lot of these things. And, and so that was so cool. And, you know, the reality was um, it got me thinking about this in the last 24 hours. So I'm glad you asked me this question. So if I could go back to the 2007 me, I think what I would tell myself is, I don't think, what I would tell myself is fail faster. Don't be afraid to fail. Like make mistakes, just do it fast, which I've gotten really good at but like let it get messy and fail really fast. And then I would tell myself to get much better at surrounding myself with amazing people. So like hiring is a skill. It's, this is not a gut feeling thing. Um, this is growing a massive business is all about getting in business with the right people and being willing to fail fast and make mistakes. And, uh, and I would do that, that like, that's the one those are like the two things I, I guess I would say, not one, but two things I would do differently or tell myself to do differently. But if I could go back even before 2007, I'd tell myself to get in real estate or sooner. Because the, the truth is like, um, I love business and I didn't know that until I got into real estate and, that, and the real estate business showed me. And, and also I might start selling my information instead of giving it all away. <laughs> so I might have a couple million dollars more in my pocket today had I done that. Um, but at the end of the day, like truth is I would tell myself to let it get messy and just fail faster. And, uh, and, and I'm just, apparently I'm gonna give you 17 things. Cause like the other thing I would do is it took me until about three years ago to master my calendar. And we talked about this last week in LA, right? Um, like I, once I got really clear and clean with myself on my calendar and I let that dictate my day based off of prior, a sense of priority, singular word priority, that's when my results really started to skyrocket. And so I would also do that earlier in my career. Yeah, love it, love, love it. Powerful stuff. Those that are watching, listen, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation truly is the start of delusion. Information is a power. It's taking that information, taking action on it that creates that power in your life for you to create the life you know you want and deserve. And Kevin shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys. They take something that you learned, go out there and implement immediately. So again, you can create the life you know you want and deserve. Also below wherever you're watching and listening is all Kevin's contact information. Make sure you go check that out. Make sure you get in that Facebook group immediately. I promise you, you won't regret it. Um, and Kevin, this has been a massive honor. Dude. I truly appreciate you taking time. I'm busy to be here, bro. Thanks, bro, dude. I appreciate it too. Anytime to hang out is, is a good time. So I appreciate, I appreciate it, Josh. Yeah, 100%, my friend. All right, you guys, thanks for watching. Listen, we'll see you next time. Peace.